guys, it's me, Professor D, and welcome back to my channel. If you haven't done so already, please don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe below. The video I'll be doing today is going to be on oxygenation. Um, guys, if there are any content that you want me to cover, just make sure you put in the comments below and I'll make sure I'll get a video up for you. So first question. The client has experienced a myocardial infarction resulting in damage to the left ventricle. A possible complication the client may experience that the nurse is alert to is one, jugular neck vein distension, two, pulmonary congestion, three, peripheral edema, or four, liver enlargement. And I'll give you a moment to think of your answer. And the correct answer, guys, is two, pulmonary congestion. So guys, they told you in the question that the patient had damage to the left ventricle, okay? So that's the left side of the heart. Left starts with what? An L. Whenever there's problems with the left side of the heart that starts with an L, the patient has lung issues because lung starts with an L as well. So. Um, any left side um, problems, the patient's going to have a lung issue such as shortness of breath, dyspnea, crackles, congestion that you're hearing in the lungs. So number two, pulmonary congestion. Pulmonary means lung, guys. Lung congestions, that's a left-sided heart failure, left-sided problem, okay? Look at your other choices. Number one, jugular neck vein distension, number three, peripheral edema, and four, liver enlargement. All of those are signs and symptoms of right-sided heart failure, okay? So when a patient has issues with the right side of the heart, you're gonna see um, these symptoms. Why? Because instead of the lungs lungs instead of the blood going to the lungs to pick up oxygen because the right side of the heart is not working properly all of that blood backs up and goes back into the body and so patient kind of looks like they're going into fluid overload they have the um jugular vein distension you'll see the pedal edema you'll see they may have uh, um um um, trunkal obesity, you see they swell up, their face swells up. Why? Because all of that blood that was supposed to be going to the lungs backs up into the body. And that's why you'll see one, three, and four in right-sided heart failure. But number two, pulmonary congestion, along with all of those other signs and symptoms I told you about, you'll see in left-sided heart failure. Okay. Next question. On admitting a client, the nurse finds that there's a history of myocardial ischemia. The most disconcerting dysrhythmia for electrocardiography to reveal is one, sinus bradycardia, two, sinus dysrhythmia, three, ventricular tachycardia, four, atrial fibrillation. And I'll give you a moment to think of your answer. And the correct answer is three. The worst thing you want to see is that patient going to VTAC, okay? That is the worst dysrhythmia aside from arrhythmia, which means the heart's not beating at all, right? So um, VTAC is the worst one because what happens is cardiac output is severely decreased. That patient um, um, is going to be hypotensive and the chances are high that that patient will go into shock. And then what happens is all of their organs collapse, okay? Sinus bradycardia, sinus dysrhythmia. When you see that word sinus, I want you to think normal. So it's normal unless the patient has, uh, um, unless they're symptomatic, okay? So sinus bradycardia, yeah, their heartbeat may be a little bit low, but they're, they're not symptomatic. They're not exhibiting any signs and symptoms. Same thing with sinus dysrhythmia. So I'm, when you hear that, see that sinus, I want you to think normal because the patient doesn't have any um, symptoms that goes with it. Okay. And the last one, AFib. We don't like AFib, but it's not as bad as a VTAC. VTAC is the worst. Like I said, aside from the patient going into a arrhythmia where their heart's just not beating at all. Next question. A client with a suspected narcotic overdose is brought to the emergency department by the police. The nurse anticipates that assessment findings will reveal, one, agitation, two, hyperpenia, three, restlessness, 
Or four, decreased level of consciousness. And I'll give you a moment to think of your answer. Okay, guys, and the correct answer is four, decreased levels of consciousness. Guys, what do narcotics do? What do opioids do? They slow everything down. They slow down the heart rate. They even slow down the patient's um, thinking process, okay? So cognitively speaking, that patient has slowed down, and it can slow down to the point that that patient goes um, into, um, what's the word I'm looking for? In a coma. All right, and I wanna show you something. I want you to pay attention. Look at one, two, and three. Agitation, hyperpenia, restlessness, okay? All of these are signs and symptoms of what? Increase, okay? The only odd man out is number four where you see something being decreased. If you guys, um, actually, I, I just made a video, 11 tips for passing NCLEX, and one of the hints I told you is when you have a multiple choice, and you don't know what the answer is, always look for the odd man out. And this is a perfect example because one, two, and three are all examples of stimulation or hyperstimulation. And four is the only one that's different. Four is actually what? Decrease. And that's actually the answer. Don't forget with narcotics, narcotics can cause sedation. Patients on narcotics, you better be checking their blood pressure. You better be checking their pulse because you don't want it to drop too low. Okay. Next question. The nurse is checking the client's overall oxygenation. In assessment of the presence of central cyanosis, the nurse will inspect the client's one, palms and soles of feet, two, nail beds, three, ear lobes, four, tongue. And I'll give you a moment to think of your answer. And the correct answer is tongue. Guys, when you're looking for central cyanosis, central. So here, face or trunk. So one, the tongue is one of the places that you could see central cyanosis. And I want you guys to take, um, take note. Look at choices one, two, and three. All of those are peripheral. Okay, those would be you'd be looking for peripheral cyanosis, the palms and soles of the feet, the nail beds, ear but um, earlobes, all of those are peripheral. The only one that is central is the tongue. The client's admitted to the emergency department with a pneumothorax. The nurse anticipates that the client will be experiencing one dyspnea, two eupnea, eupnea, excuse me, three fremitus, or four orthopnea. So the correct answer is one, dyspnea, difficulty breathing. That patient is in the ER with a pneumothorax. What is a pneumothorax? That's collapse of the lung. Of course, they're going to have difficulty breathing. Okay? So look at the other um, choices. Eupenia. Whenever you see that, um, those two letters, E-U, in front of the root word, that means to be balanced. Okay? So eupenia means normal breathing. Well, if the lungs collapse, that patient's not gonna be breathing normally. Three, fremitus, that's, those are the vibrations that you feel when that patient um, is speaking. You're supposed to uh, feel those vibrations. Obviously, if that lung is collapsed, uh, no, the fremitus is gonna be decreased, okay? You may not feel it at all. And orthopnea, orthopnea is difficulty breathing when the patient's lying down. Patients who have orthopnea, for example, or COPD patients, they need to be sitting up or leaning forward in order to breathe, okay? So for these choices, for a collapsed lung, that patient's gonna have difficulty breathing and the correct answer is one. Number 13. The client with a chronic obstructive respiratory disease is receiving oxygen via nasal cannula. Which of the following interventions does the nurse plan to include in the client's care? One, assess nares for skin breakdown every six hours. Two, check patency of nasal cannula every two hours. Three, inspect the mouth every six hours. Four, check oxygen flow every 24 hours.
And the correct answer is one, that patient with COPD, remember when they have COPD, they're gonna be get, getting oxygen. But remember that oxygen is going to be low flow. We never, ever, ever, ever give a patient oxygen anything more than three liters. And even with three liters, we're iffy about, okay? Because remember, with those COPD patients, um, the more oxygen we give them, we turn off their uh, drive to actually breathe, okay? So the reason number one is the correct answer, oxygen's very what? Drying. And so what happens, we're concerned about um, the nasal cannula and that patient getting oxygen through the nasal cannula and that oxygen um, drying out the nares, causing cracking. Because what can happen when it cracks? Bacteria can set in. So that's our concern, okay? So any patient that's getting oxygen via nasal cannula, we're going to be checking them for skin breakdown. And sometimes we have to give them oxygenate oxygen that um, is um, moist, moistened so that uh, their skin doesn't break down, okay? Hum moist, I couldn't think of the word, humidified. Sometimes we have to give them humidified oxygen just to keep that skin from breaking down. All of the following clients are experiencing increased respiratory secretions and require intervention to assist in their removal. Chest percussion is indicated and appropriate for the client experiencing one, thrombocytopenia, two, cystic fibrosis, three, osteoporosis, or four, spinal fracture. And I'll give you a moment to think of your answer. And the correct answer is two, guys. We're going to be doing chest percussion. We're going to be trying to loosen up those secretions, those mucus plugs on the patient that has cystic fibrosis. Why? The patient that has cystic fibrosis, they create an excessive amount of mucus and that mucus is thick and it's not moving. It clogs everything up. And sometimes they produce it in the lungs. Sometimes they produce it in the pancreas and sometimes they can produce it in both. Okay. So let me explain this to you. Let me go to the pancreas first. We're not talking about that. That's not in the question, but since I'm talking about it, I might as well explain it to you. So let's say that patient that has cystic fibrosis, they're um, creating those excessive mucus plugs in the pancreas. What happens is they're going to have to get pancreatic enzymes, okay? What is that? Remember, your pancreas naturally produces enzymes that break down the food when the food gets in your small intestines, right? But the person with cystic fibrosis, if they're creating, creating those mucus plugs in the pancreas, the pancreas is not making those enzymes anymore. And so they have to, every time they eat, they have to sprinkle that powdered enzyme on their food so the food can get broken down once it gets into the small intestine. They have to put those enzymes on, I mean, when I say food, I mean even a snack. Anything that goes in their mouth, it has to go with pancreatic enzymes. Why? Because their pancreas can't produce it anymore because of all that mucus. Now, that same patient with cystic fibrosis, let's say it's in the lungs. Same thing, well, not same thing with enzymes, but same thing though the mucus is clogging up the lungs. That patient's not going to be able to breathe. So constantly that patient's going to need chest percussion so you can loosen up those secretions. They need to be drinking lots of fluids to loosen up all of those mucus plugs so that they can cough it up, okay? So that's what cystic fibrosis is. And that's why number two is the um, answer, okay? Look at number one, thrombocytopenia, patients making a little bit of platelets. That has nothing to do with chest percussions. Okay, if a patient has thrombocytopenia, they're at risk for what? Bleeding, because if you're not making platelets, you're not clotting. Number three, osteoporosis. That's when your bones are porous. That has nothing to do with needing chest percussion. And of course, um, a spinal fracture, same thing. The correct answer is number two, and I explained to you why. Let's move on to the next question. The nurse is working on a pulmonary unit at the local hospital. The nurse is alert to one of the early signs of hypoxia in the clients, which is one, cyanosis, two, restlessness, three, decreased respiratory rate, four, decreased blood pressure. And the correct answer is to high, uh, restlessness, excuse me. Guys, the number one, the number one symptom 
of patient get, becoming hypoxemic is a change in the level of consciousness, a change in their cognition, okay? Restlessness, okay? That's a symptom. So you have a patient that was normally awake, alert, oriented, they were acting normal, now all of a sudden they're restless. That's a sign of hypoxia, okay? That's one of the um, biggest changes uh, biggest changes biggest signs of hypoxia when you see mental changes in the patient such as restlessness such as agitation such as confusion okay next question in teaching a client about an upcoming diagnostic test the nurse identifies that which one of the following uses an injection of contrast material one halter monitor two echocardiography three cardiac catheterization or four exercise stress test and the correct answer is cardiac catheterization that uses contrast media do not forget guys Whenever a patient's going to get contrast media, you better look through their chart, look at their allergies, make sure you ask the patient about allergies. If that patient has an allergy to iodine, if they have an allergy to shellfish, you better call up the physician right away. And let me explain to you what happens. If that patient has an allergy to iodine or shellfish, if that test is not absolutely necessary, for them to live, the patient's go, the doctor or the surgeon is going to be like, oh, well, okay, let's cancel it. But on some occasions, we have no choice. Even if the patient's allergic to iodine or shellfish, if that patient um, needs that test, what happens is the doctor is going to order for you to give a bolus of fluid before and after, and also a patient might get some Benadryl, okay? But it's very important for you to know, generally speaking, patient um, is getting contrast media such as a cardiac cath, you better check and make sure they're not allergic to iodine or shellfish. And if they are, you have to call the physician right away. Now let's go over these other choices. The halter monitor, that's basically a portable ECG, okay, machine. And the thing with the halter monitor, you have to remember the patient can't get in the shower with it. They can't get it wet. Okay, so you have to teach that to the patient. The echo, basic, basically that shows the heart's performance. And number four, the exercise stress test, that actually shows how um, well the heart does under stress, such as running on a treadmill. It shows how well the body handles increased metabolic demands, which obviously will happen if the patient's running. Next question. At a community health fair, the nurse informs the residents that the influenza vaccine is recommended for clients, one, only older than the age of 65, two, 40 to 60 years of age, three, in any age group who have a chronic disease, four, who have an acute febrile illness. And I'll give you a moment to think of your answer. The correct answer is three, in any age group who have a chronic illness. And when I say chronic illness, I mean like if they have asthma or COPD, sickle cell, any patient that has a chronic illness, they need to be the first one in line to get the flu shot. Why? Because their body cannot handle them getting the flu. Okay, that might be enough to put them six feet under, okay? Now, number one, you should have gotten rid of immediately because remember in my, in my 11 tips to pass NCLEX video, I told you guys about absolutes to stay away from them. Stay away from those answer choices that say only, always, never, such as number one. So you should have got rid of that immediately. Then you have number two, ages 40 to 60 years of age. That's just wrong. And then three, uh, excuse me, and then four, anyone who has an acute febrile illness. Actually, no. If a patient has um, an illness with a fever, they got a fever 101 or higher, they can't get the vaccine, okay? They have to go ahead and heal and then they can get the vaccine afterwards. So the correct answer is three. Next question. The unit manager is orienting a new staff nurse and evaluates which of the following as an appropriate technique for nasal tracheal suctioning. One, placing the client in a supine position. Two, preparing for a clean not or non-sterile technique. Three, suctioning the oropharyngeal area first, 
then the nasal tracheal area. Four, applying intermittent suction for about 10 seconds during catheter removal. And the correct answer is four. All of the other choices are just wrong, okay? But four, let me explain this to you. So you want to, um, when you're suctioning the patient, you never suction going in. You only suction coming out, okay? And when you suction coming out, you're suctioning in a rotating fashion and you wanna suction intermittently for about 10 to 15 seconds. And you always want to hyper-oxygenate the patient before and after you suction. A couple other things you have to know about suctioning because lots of questions come from suctioning, okay? Um, so you hyper-oxygenate the patient before and after suctioning. You only suction coming out, never going in. When you do suction coming out, you're gonna do it in a rotating fashion intermittently, 10 to 15 seconds. Oh, and a maximum, three passes. Some textbooks say two passes, so um, look to see which one your textbook says. If you guys get a question on NCLEX about it, it's going to be far off. So it's not going to be two or three. They're going to say something like five or six. So you either know it or you don't. Okay. So depending on your textbook, two or three passes. But then after that, you have to allow your client to rest. You can't just keep suctioning, suctioning. Why? Because even though you're suctioning and you're helping getting rid of those secretions, what else are you taking away from the client? Oxygen. You're taking oxygen away from the client, and that's why you have to hyper-oxygenate them before and after each pass, okay? So after the second or third, depending on your textbook, allow that client to rest. Allow them to catch their breath, and then you're going to assess them, and if you have to suction again, you're going to go ahead and start over. The client has supplemental oxygen in place and requires suctioning to remove excess secretions from the airway. To promote maximum oxygenation, an appropriate action by the nurse is to one, suction continuously for 30 second intervals, two, replace the oxygen and allow rest in between suction passes, three, increase the amount of suction pressure to 200, or four, complete a number of suctioning passes until the catheter comes back clear. And you guys should know the answer because I already gave it to you. I just gave it to you guys. So the correct answer is two. You want to replace oxygen, allow rest in between suctioning passes. Look at our other choices. One says suction continuously for 30 second intervals. Well, I just told you, you want to suction intermittently and you want to do it 10 to 15 seconds. So you know number one's wrong. Number three, increase the amount of suction pressure to 200. No, the highest you can go is to 120, okay? So your suction, you want it to be around 80 to 120, but 120 is a max. So you're definitely not gonna be doing 200, okay? And then number four, complete a number of suctioning passes until the catheter comes back. Absolutely not. Remember I told you, depending on your textbook, two, maybe three passes, and then that's it. That client needs to rest. You need to reassess them, then you can um, suction them if needed. Next question. A client with a chest tube in place is being transported via stretcher to another room closer to the nurse's station. During the transport, the collection unit bangs against the wall and breaks open. The nurse immediately, one, clamps the tube, two, tells the client to hyperventilate, three, Raise the tubing above the client's chest level. Four, places the end of the tube in a container of sterile water. And the correct answer is four. You're going to place the end of the tube in sterile water, guys. This is going to create um, um, the same seal as um, the collection system, okay? Because remember, the collection system also had that water and you would see the, the, the gentle bubbling. Same thing, okay? So when you put that end of the tube in sterile water, it creates the same seal as um, the collection uh, unit. Let's look at our other choices. One, clamping the tube. Uh, no, if you clamp that tube, you know what you're gonna cause? A pneumothorax. You're gonna cause that lung to collapse. So that's a no-no. Two, tell the client to hyperventilate. Absolutely not. If anything, you can tell the client to um, cough because coughing will help create that negative pressure that you want. Number three, raising the tube above the client's chest. No, that's not going to do anything. What you want to do is put the end of that tube in sterile water, okay, and create a seal. 
Next question. The client's experiencing a sinus dysrhythmia with a pulse of 82 beats per minute. Upon entering the room, the nurse expects to find the client, one, extremely fatigued, two, complaining of chest pain, three, experiencing a fluttering sensation of the chest, or four, having no clinical signs based on assessment. And the correct answer is four. Guys, remember when I told you sinus, I want you to think normal. Even those, you know, um, maybe if it's like, for example, if it's sinus bradycardia, yes, that heart rate's a low, but it's still normal. The patient doesn't have any symptoms. When you see that word sinus, I want you to think normal because the patient's not experiencing any symptoms. And that's exactly what we have here with number four, having no clinical signs based on the, sense, on the assessment. The patients, they're not symptomatic. Now let's look at our other choices. One, extremely fatigued. You'd see that in a patient that has AFib or a patient that's highly anemic. Two, complaining of chest pain. You'd see that in a patient that's having a myocardial infarction, a heart attack, right? Three, patient experiencing a fluttering sensation in the chest. That's something you'd see in a patient experiencing atrial fibrillation, AFib, okay? Next question. A client's admitted to the medical center with a diagnosis of right-sided heart failure. In assessment of this client, the nurse expects to find one, dyspnea, two, confusion, three, dizziness, or four, peripheral edema. And I hope you guys all got this answer correct because I think it was the first question I and I explained the difference between left-sided heart failure and right-sided heart failure. With left-sided heart failure, you'll see long symptoms such as shortness of breath, dyspnea, crackles, right? But with right-sided heart failure, you're going to see those generalized system, um, um, symptoms. You're going to see um, the um, uh, symptoms of the system, such as jugular vein distension such as facial edema, such as peripheral edema, which is number four, okay? Those signs and symptoms of right-sided heart failure, ascites, okay? Next question. The nurse is preparing to teach a group of adult women about the signs and symptoms of myocardial infarction, a heart attack. The nurse will include in the teaching plan the results of research that demonstrate women may experience specific symptoms, such as one, visual difficulties, two, epigastric pain, three, loss of motor function uni unilaterally, or four, right scapular discomfort and stiffness. And the correct answer is two, epigastric pain. Let me explain something to you guys. Even though twice is more, does, does that, twice is more, twice as many, twice as many men get heart attacks than women do, more women die from heart attacks than men do. So let me explain this to you. I want to make sure you guys understand, okay? With men, when they get heart attacks, they get those classic symptoms. They get that chest pain. They feel like a elephant is standing on their chest, okay? That um, pain, it might radiate to their left arm, their left jaw. They get those classic symptoms of a heart attack. So immediately, they're like, call 911. But with women, the signs and symptoms of a heart attack in women are very vague, okay? They tend to be like, oh, you know what? I'm having some real bad indigestion today. They think it's gas. They think it's acid. Okay. They'll have epigastric pain and they don't realize it's a heart attack because it's not, the symptoms are not, not as pronounced as it is for men. So that's very important. So you have to teach women that for them, if, you know, if they have heart disease, they have hypertension, they have high cholesterol, which puts them, they're obese, which puts them at risk for having a myocardial infarction, you have to teach them, hey, if you're feeling really bad epigastric pain, you may think it's indigestion, but you need to seek help because it may be a heart attack, okay? So even though way more men get heart attacks than women, Way more women die from heart attacks than men just because their symptoms are not as pronounced. So that's why the correct answer is number two, epigastric pain. Okay. Next question. 
Next question. The primary reason a client with chronic obstructive pulmonary disease often experiences fatigue and activity intolerance is related to one, the increased presence of surfactant that results in sticky alveoli, two, the presence of chronic infections in the lung and bronchial tree, <coughs> excuse me, three, the extra energy that's needed to exhale the air from the damaged lungs, or four, the client's elevated anxiety related to the air hunger being experienced. And I'll give you guys a moment. Okay, the correct answer is three, the extra energy that's needed to exhale air from the damaged lungs. So what happens is those patients that have um, COPD, they lose their elastic recoil. Okay, and so that's why you see those patients that have COPD, you see they look like they have the barrel chest, right? Why are they walking around looking like this? The reason they're looking like this is because all of that um, COPD that they're supposed to breathe out is still stuck in their lungs. Why? They lost that elastic recoil to push out the COPD. Okay, so that's why you see them always walking around with the barrel chest. Okay, that's why those patients, if you check their um, CO2 levels, remember normal CO2 is 35 to 45, right? They're going to be way past 45. Why? Because instead of breathing off that CO2, they're holding it all in. That's why one of the important teachings you do with the COPD patients, you teach them how to exercise those lungs to get out the CO2. How? You teach them personal breathing. You teach them to pretend like they're blowing out a candle and to go like this. Slowly, exercising the lungs, helping getting out that CO2, right? Or you teach them to pretend that there's a pencil on the table and they need to move that pencil with their breath. If they go like this, are they gonna move the pencil? No, they have to make their lips in the circular motion and blow like this in order to move the pencil. That's called pursed lip breathing and that's what you teach to the COPD patient. So that's why they're out of breath all the time. They got all that, all that um, CO2 in their lungs that they're trying to um, move out all the time. So that's why they're always so fatigued. It makes sense. Next question, pregnancy. Pregnancy affects a woman's oxygenation needs primarily because one, the increased metabolic demands required to support the fetus. Two, increased tendency to develop anemia as a result of low iron reserves. Three, decreased ability to engage in physical exercise required to promote circulation. Or four, the decreased lung capacity resulting from pressure of the uterus on the diaphragm. And the correct answer is one, the increased metabolic demands to requ um, required to support the fetus. Because now you need to think about it. Oxygen is carried in hemoglobin. Hemoglobin is carried in blood. The blood is pushed out by what? The heart, right? So now that heart is responsible for pushing blood to provide oxygen, not only to mommy, but to the fetus. So guess what? The metabolic demands have increased. And so that's an increased demand on the body, specifically the heart. And we're down to our last question. The nurse is caring for a client who experienced a flail chest injury that's multiple rib fractures as a result of a motorcycle accident. The nurse realizes that pain management for this client will directly impact the effectiveness of his respiratory functioning primarily because one, pain increases metabolic needs, thus increasing oxygen consumption. Two, pain increases emotional distress, which can lead to hyperventilation. Three, pain will de decrease the client's motivation to deep breathe, contributing to shallow, diminished inspirations. Four, Pain will decrease the client's ability to both relax and recuperate, thus extending the period of recovery. I'll give you a moment to think of your answer. And the correct answer is three, guys. Pain will decrease the client's motivation to debrief, contributing to shallow, diminished 
inspirations. I want you to think about what happened. So the patient got in a car accident. They got a couple ribs that are broken, right? Remember guys, those ribs are what protects the lungs, right? But now you got flail chest. So you got one lung that's working just fine and you got one lung that's just kaput, okay? This patient is in pain, but that lung that's now kaput, you want it to um, reinflate. And so the patient has to do those lung exercises. You want that patient to turn, cough, deep breathe. You think that patient's going to want to deep breathe when they're in pain? No. Let me tell you what they're going to do. You're going to have them do those lung exercises and they're going to fake it. They're going to be like, and they're gonna do it really shallow because it's painful. Why is it painful? Every time they take a deep breath, remember that lung, that lung, that rib is broken. So it's every time that rib moves, it's very painful for them. So a priority for this patient, before you try to get them to deep breathe, you have to make sure that patient's adequately medicated. Okay, you have to make sure you get that pain level managed so they can deep breathe like they're supposed to so you can help that lung reoxygenate. I know I said last question, but actually this is the last question. I have one more. I really want to do this question with you. The nurse is preparing to discuss MIs with a women's group. Which of the following assessment findings should be included when discussing the typically observed signs and symptoms in females experiencing an MI? One, originates both at rest and upon exertion. Two, pain lasting longer than 30 minutes. Three, pain radiating up to the left jaw. Four, significant gastric, gastric indigestion. And you guys should know this answer because I talked to you about this ad nauseum. The correct answer is four. For women, significant gastric indigestion. So you make sure you teach that to women who are at risk for myocardial infarctions. Guys, I hope you guys enjoyed this video. I hope you guys learned a lot. Um, thank you so much for joining me. Please do not forget, if you haven't done so already, please like, comment, and subscribe below, and I'll see you guys next time.